All right, Katrine, you want to go ahead and get us started? Um, I think Katrine's having some audio issues, so I will just go ahead and say that uh, we are very excited for this session. Just a few things to point out. Uh, we do have captions enabled, so if you would like to use captions, just simply click on the show captions icon in the Zoom toolbar. Um, if that's not visible, you just click on more and it should be there as an option. We are recording the session, which you probably saw a little note about that. And additionally, we will have an evaluation at the end of the session, and we will show you this slide at the end of the session. So you can either use the evaluation link in the chat or scan the QR code with your phone. So with that, we will let Allison take over. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you're all doing okay. Nice to see you. Um, I hope for you, you're on the other side of a rough grading period. I should disclose immediately that I am in the middle of rough times, uh, academic integrity wise. So if like a weird slide with a puppy on it ends up in the middle of my presentation, you'll know it's because uh, our office is super busy this time of year and we are uh, working super hard. Um, but I'm glad to take this break and to be with you to talk about um, citation. I've been thinking about this a lot. I think about this as a sort of work in progress. And I know some of you here uh, have different experiences, more experiences, other expertise. And so I wanna make sure that um, we make some time for, uh, for you to share that. I'm gonna share my screen and just kind of talk you through a couple of things. And then I'll ask uh, for you to think about it, uh, a few questions. Um, so the title here, uh, Originally, I was thinking about citation machines as uh, citation generation tools that students have been using for a really long time. EasyBib is one that uh, students often refer to. NoodleBib um, is another one. Uh, but of course, other like citation management software like Zotero or Mendeley also can produce citations and have been doing that for a long time. Um, but really, I was thinking about how uh, AI, uh, generative AI tools have kind of challenge the way we think about citation and what we're doing when we're actually citing things. Um, and so in considering how to give uh, reasonable and meaningful guidance to students, um, those were some of the sort of big picture questions that I was thinking about. Um, so a lot of different libraries, uh, academic libraries, and, and I include at the bottom here, the Purdue OWL, which I know a lot of folks use, um, ha have resources that are specific to AI and citation. Um, the ones that I've put here are kind of the ones that I've, I think are um, the most useful and I'll have a list of these with their links and stuff on our Academic Integrity SharePoint page later today. Um, they each have different, um, I think, strengths and weaknesses. So I have a few notes for each of them that I'll put up with them so that if you're looking for something in particular, like Waterloo, for example, in Canada, that page has a huge, um, a, a much more robust set of um, resources for thinking through some of the ethical questions about using AI, for example. Um, whereas um, the, um, the NYU one is mostly focused on sort of the mechanics of, of what a citation for uh, uh, someone using an AI tool would look like. So I'll put up some annotations of those um, really helpful resources. Just to show you an example, I actually think University of Wisconsin Whitewater's LibGuide um, has a little, I think students find it helpful to look at um, uh, diagrams that point out which pieces of a citation are doing, are doing what. Um, and so I think they do a good job kind of um, giving a little bit of anatomy of citation uh, when it comes to when it comes to generative AI. This example is is in Turabian uh, style. Um, in most libguides, the attention is is on I think uh, some of the most common citation styles used for undergraduates, APA and MLA. Um, but you can find uh, links to or sometimes attention to Turabian Chicago. Um, some of the uh, various citation styles that might be used uh, in the sciences. So I gave you some resources for how to cite things in, uh, when you use AI and it feels like sort of 
um, the end, but obviously I am just kidding because um, there's a few more minutes to go. Uh, but also I think just having the resources, just knowing, oh, I can go to this website and look at the format for how to cite generative AI in APA format, for example, um, probably isn't enough. I'm guessing you came here uh, bec because you have more questions or um, maybe some issues that have popped up or sort of you're thinking uh, in other ways uh, about about that. Um, and so I'd like to know either out loud from uh, those who want to share or in the chat, um, what are some of the questions that you came in with today? What are you hoping to get out of our session um, with, with regards to sort of citation practices and um, generative AI? So shout them out or throw them in the chat. Thanks, Adam. Adam says, what are authentic ways for helping students understand why and then how to cite? I like that question. Thanks. Other questions or goals? Thanks, Sonia. Machine as in how to cite as much as possible without actually doing the research using AI to do that. Thanks. Great. Others want to jump in with goals or questions? Laura, thank you. I was hoping to learn more about the best ways to teach students to cite sources, when to escalate and other options. Great, thanks. Thanks, Nathan. What are students allowed to cite regarding their use of AI? These are great questions. Thanks, you can keep popping these into the chat. Um, I, think, I think I'll be addressing these. Oh, thanks, Ainara. When do we cite AI? Do I have to cite when asking AI for feedback? That's a great question too, thanks. I hope I'll start addressing these. Some I have sort of answers to and others I have like annoyingly more questions about. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but I do think this is a productive um, conversation. I have a few things I'll share with you that hopefully can move us forward a little bit. Um, so I think our questions absolutely suggest uh, that there are challenges for accounting for the use of generative AI tools um, in a, an academic project. Um, but first, I guess I'll acknowledge um, that students are in fact using generative AI. Um, the study I'm referring to here, intelligent.com did a 2023 survey, May, 20, which is like, seems like forever ago um, in terms of the developments of AI. And so when I look at this survey that says 30% of college students are, are frequently using chat GPT for schoolwork um, a year out, um, my experience has been um, that number it has gone has gone up is going up. The tools are um, more uh, more visible, more available, um, and and uh, more prevalent to the students. I think who are saying in May 2023, those 70 percent of students were sort of like, "Nah, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want this to be part of my process. I already have a process. Thank you very much." Um, I think uh, this have have come on board. Um, not all of them, obviously, but uh, but this 30% is, is um, probably skyrocketed since May, 2023. Um, part of it, I think is there's, uh, and I've talked about this quite a lot recently. Um, Grammarly is the example that I give a lot. There are AI tools that are tools that are powered by AI now um, that have changed in nature or in substance. So like Grammarly was a tool that um, kind of came online in, in 2009. Uh, it was not AI powered. Um, it now has AI powered features. And so students may or may not recognize that what they're doing is using an AI tool. Uh, likewise, faculty might say, sure, go ahead and use Grammarly um, without really realizing um, what they're actually authorizing. Um, and so Grammarly is just one example. This is, it, it's such a landscape of tools that keep, that the tools keep changing, uh, names of tools change, uh, tools that didn't formerly have AI power, now do. Um, and so I think for us as faculty, there's there's a really overwhelming uh, feeling of like, well, cool, I'll just learn all the tools and keep up with all the tools that are changing their names and changing their features. And that's um, totally going to occupy every living moment of my time. Um, so I think 
I have some suggestions for sort of working through that, um, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, the the quote that's on this slide, I'm a student, you have no idea how much we're using ChatGPT is actually from the Chronicle of Higher Education's most read article uh, of the year. Um, it was written by a student uh, who um, talked pretty, who wrote pretty candidly about uh, how they were using um, AI. Um, and I think uh, when we hear students talk about this, uh, it reflects some of the research I've seen um, in which students um, sort of over, overestimate their abilities to be critical about information. Um, they overestimate their, uh, or they're overconfident in their information literacy skills, and especially their digital literacy skills if we're thinking about things like privacy and data security and things like that. Um, the sort of like digital natives narrative that our students um, kind of uh, are comfortable in uh, digital spaces it is, um, is problematic. Um, for many for many reasons. Um, and so those are some of the things that are I think are important to contextualize about about the landscape. Um, oh yeah, Shed also mentions in the chat, I wonder how AI is integrated into our daily lives in small ways that we take for granted, like predictive text and emails. Totally. There's so many ways AI is already part of our regular um, kind of ins and outs of of daily life. And so making the distinction between what is AI powered and what is not is challenging. And I think um, just reading some of the research, like that's gonna become more difficult. Um, the, the boundaries are going to kind of become way, um, way blurrier. Um, so I think in considering this question of sort of what are students doing with AI when they're using it, if we're giving guidance to students about what's okay to use and what's not okay to use, and I'll get to that uh, in a minute, um, we need to be able to give them resources for sort of how to acknowledge that they're, that they're using AI. Um, but I think before we can even really think about how to do that effectively, it's worth considering sort of what we're actually doing when we're citing. Um, in our in the, the writing program a while ago, we had some good conversations about how we teach citation, um, and the answer wasn't um, we we go through the um, the anatomy of the citation and tell students where to put a period and where to put parentheses and when to italicize and when to use quotation marks around a title versus not. Um, we we teach the concept of citation, like citation is the academic practice. Um, of acknowledging where uh, your, your work is rooted, where it comes from, where ideas come from, where words come from. Um, and it helps you sort of build on what other people are saying. Um, and so when we look at this, this is from the uh, University of North Carolina, at Chapel Hill, uh, their university libraries page. Um, in general, what they say about citation reflects what we see in a lot of spaces, right? That citations are about uh, are because we want to build on the work of others. We want to add our own contributions. Um, they allow us to indicate which ideas are taken from others, um, and uh, and to build your argument on um, other people's uh, research. And so already in this text, I've drawn out some of the words that are complicated for me when I try to apply this to AI, right? Like others' ideas, like is AI generating uh, an idea? Is AI creative? I mean, like these are um, much bigger questions, right? The idea of authorship when it comes to AI tools, are AI tools authors? Can an AI um, be a creator of something? Um, and then this question of whether AI is, is itself um, research. Um, this is just one more. Um, this is from University of Wisconsin University Libraries page. Um, they mention in their sort of why do we cite and what is citation, um, th the notion that uh, that we're looking at sources of information. And the question of whether AI is tools or sources is another complicated question. Um, and it's certainly the, the sort of trail um, the site says citations are a great way to leave a trail intended to help others who may want to explore the conversation or use those sources themselves. Um, and so most of us know at this point that uh, if we're using a generative AI tool, uh, unless we're using the tool to create a citation for us or we're documenting it um, separately, um, 
there, there is no actual trail. Like we can say what we did, we can describe what we did, we can write it down, um, but uh, someone else cannot recreate what we've, recreate that process or they can recreate the process, but the result will be different. So the difference between like, um, a Google search, or uh, if I've if I've done um, research from a book in the library, and my reader wants to find that book, they can find it in the actual library. They can go to the shelf. They can pull the book off the shelf. Um, AI is, is not um, AI tools outputs are not static. They're dynamic, and so that means every time a search is done or a, a query is done, an input is made, a prompt is generated, um, it's going to produce something different. There might be slight differences, even to even to the same exact question formulated exactly the same way. There might be slight differences, but it's not like we can go and sort of test against itself um, because it's always changing because data is always getting scraped and added. And so it's a dynamic space. So that's complicated when it comes to citation. If we think about kind of being able to recreate someone's search, locate their sources, um, and so I think that leads us to, to sort of like ways our citation strategies, especially in how we teach them are not quite adequate. Um, I think this means we have to talk to students about these things. Like, I don't think students really realize um, that outputs are dynamic, that they will vary um, even with the same prompts. Um, I don't think students have thought a lot about um, what AI really is when we ask these questions about what research is and what citation is. Um, I think students can lump AI tools together into sort of two baskets. One is sources, um, which is problematic for some of the reasons we've mentioned, um, and then help, which can also be problematic for some of the reasons um, I'll get to. Um, so this question about AI tools as, as research um, kind of necessitates that we identify some of the things that, or remind ourselves some of the things that AI tools can do. And these are some of the ways that I think students are using these tools as far as I've seen. Um, for outlining, for brainstorming, to, um, to get feedback, um, to analyze data, to suggest sources. Um, a lot of students who are uh, studying for tests are sort of putting sample or kind of asking AI to generate sample questions to test them, things like that. None of that really feels quite like research in, a, in the traditional ways we would define research. Um, I've recently been reading um, this book by Ethan Mollick. If you don't know him, uh, he's, been, he's been on this sort of like AI conversation circuit for a long time, but uh, he's on the faculty at um, Wharton's Business School and was recently featured in um, the Ezra Klein Show uh, podcast um, about AI. I would recommend the episode. I would recommend his blog also. Um, these are some of the chapter titles uh, in his book. Um, and, and I'll say none of his chapter titles uh, include AI as research. Um, and so he's really kind of asking us to uh, think about uh, AI tools as doing something different uh, than, than sort of research. And so that means um, he's presenting something challenging to think about in terms of um, citation then. Um, you've probably also seen if you, if you use YouTube at all, or maybe this is just me because the algorithms like come right my way, um, the Grammarly advertisements um, for, uh, for um, Grammarly's uh, writing assistants. Um, they're using they're using words like assistant um, and uh, um, tutor and partner uh, to describe what AI is doing. Um, so what what can we do? Um, this this photo really spoke to me today, <laughs> and maybe it does to you too. These feel like really heavy lifts that I think um, ask us to think critically about what we're saying to students, what kind of guidance and information we're giving, um, and, and how we can expose this topic in, in some productive ways. So I think some of this will be familiar to anyone who's come to any of my things over the past year. I spend a lot of time um, talking about um, how uh, important it is to give clear guidance to students about whether AI, generative AI tools are permitted or not, and how you want students to account for that. 
Um, what sources of help are okay for students to use in your course? So knowing that a lot of students, again, there's sort of two baskets that students, I think, put AI tools in. One of them is help. And so being more clear about what's help in a responsible sense for your class and what's not um, is really useful. Um, and then this last one, I think, touches on something that's important to my mind to, to kind of um, address the concern about the changing landscape of AI tools. So I mentioned that um, AI tools are changing name and uh, the functions are changing and it's, um, it's, it's a dynamic landscape. And so I think this question of, are you clear about what it's okay to use AI to do is the, is the more important question than what tools are okay to use? And, and I'll make that distinction clearer. Um, instead of using the name of the tool, like it's okay to use chat GPT, use the function that you think it's okay for a student to use the tool to perform. So it's okay to use a generative AI tool for brainstorming, allows the student to understand that there aren't other functions that they can use the tool for except brainstorming, and they may have other tools, AI tools that they're used to using. This also will get complicated by equity questions, who has access to paid tools versus who doesn't. Um, and so I think long-term, um, I'm gonna be singing this song uh, a, a lot. I think it's one of our best sort of approaches to talking to students about um, these questions. So saying you can't use G chat GPT in my class, um, is, is, is too narrow because there's millions of other AI tools, right? Um, likewise, if you said uh, you can use Grammarly, you're saying the student can use any of the capacities that Grammarly has, some of which you may not know. And so thinking about what functions it's okay for a student to use AI to perform is a really good starting place. And if you wanna think about this more, um, I really recommend this, um, this video. Maybe you've seen this before. I've I've introduced it in a few different CTRL things. Um, Joss Fong's uh, Vox video, AI can do your homework, now what? Um, there's a lot of really interesting kind of uh, people talking in the video, but at one point she uses this chart to kind of identify some of the functions that AI tools can perform. And I think it's a useful way to kind of get used to that idea of um, function over sort of um, brand name. Um, the, the most important thing that I feel like we've we've tried to emphasize from my my where I sit in academic integrity is transparency. And I think I've seen faculty across the university and sort of across um, some of the higher ed conversations that I've been in over the last year do some interesting and creative things. And so um, it, if we're saying generative AI tools aren't exactly research and citing them is, complicated, um, then we might rethink the way we ask students for, to account for their use. So um, asking students to create a resources page in addition to a references page or bibliography, that's a separate page that, it, that asks them in some format that you think is appropriate to, um, to name and describe the use of all the things they used as resources. So this really challenges the way students think about help. Um, my colleague, uh, Cindy Bear Van Dam in the writing program and I did a presentation about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, she asked her students even to account for things like I let my mom read my paper or I asked my roommate to proofread. I went to the writing center um, and it really um, reminded students that um, we all need other people um, and that we all need help. Uh, and when we can account for it, our processes and our, and our, um, and our work is that much more transparent. Um, some kind of reflection activity is always a good idea. Um, I know Betsy Cohn in SIS has done a lot of um, re reflection requirements when she's allowed students to use certain kinds of, um, certain kinds of generative AI tools. Um, some kind of presentation or conversation that allows students to sort of talk about what they've created or talk about um, what they've learned to talk about their process, to expose some of the ways they've used the tools that they've used, um, creates a culture of, of sharing and learning rather than a culture of 
um, I'm going to catch you using doing something you're not supposed to be doing. So those are, I think, are like broad, like kind of umbrella topics or umbrella ideas that I've seen people using um, that I think are good ways around some of the challenges that citing AI tools presents. Um, and big picture, I think this contributes to um, more substantial or like sort of deeper learning goals that are oriented in concepts like information literacy. AI literacy is a term that is emerged and will, it's, it's actually not super new, but, um, but it's something that we're gonna see across the higher education landscape um, that has to do with um, sort of awareness of, um, of kind of information related behavior um, context. Um, reflecting on help in a deeper way, I think, is um, is really important. And, and as we move forward, I think it's only going to get more complicated. Um, and then our uh, ethical reasoning questions. I mean, the 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 size of the text here <laughs> and the mention of the risks um, is is too small in in this presentation for me. Um, but the 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 kind of bias that uh, AI tools can produce, um, hallucinations, fake sources, um, the labor issues, environmental issues, issues of privacy, um, some uh, copyright oriented intellectual property court cases that are still getting worked out. We don't know the answers to those. Um, the potential impacts of, of, of generative AI as a thing and in use um, is, is worth considering for students. It's worth considering for anyone who's who's um, who's going to use these tools. Um, I thought I would mention kind of what's happening in scholarly work for a few reasons. Um, one, I think we don't have, we haven't, I haven't been part of too many conversations about this, and I would like to know. <laughs> um, but also, I think um, this potentially can inform. Uh, what we do with students and the ways we potentially like use uh, the scholarly standards of journals or professional organizations as models or as a place to start when creating some of the materials we might um, we might use for giving students guidance. Scholars are definitely using AI uh, AI tools for a huge variety of purposes. Um, I was looking at a nature survey that again was uh, 2023, I think it's October 2023, 30% um, said uh, they'd used generative AI tools. So 30% of those survey respondents, 55% said they thought the major benefit of AI tools was to edit and translate writing for multilingual researchers. So kind of like accessibility of research across languages. Um, and uh, the article that I've got at the bottom there is ChatGPT make, making scientists hyperproductive, the highs and lows of using AI um, is really interesting. Nature has been doing a lot of work about this, um, that for some, for, in some areas uh, of scientific research, there's so much more research being produced because uh, scientists may be using some of these tools that expedite a process or, um, or handle, uh, busy work, labor that takes normally a long time, doesn't take as long if someone is using AI to process information or articulate information. And so um, the amount of material that scientific journals are seeing uh, has, has um, skyrocketed. And so you have a ton of um, potential scholarship in the, the scholarly marketplace. Uh, it raises questions about how we separate uh, um, knowledge building research from uh, research that's that's not uh, as solid. And so this is creating um, some challenges there. Um, a lot of scholars report using generative AI for manuscript feedback. So getting, um, getting commentary and um, help with something they've already written, um, writing grants or other things that have sort of formulaic structures, um, writing code, um, brainstorming research ideas, um, conducting literature reviews. The literature reviews was, uh, is, is generally uh, in multiple things that I've read, uh, something that a lot of scholars are, are using uh, generative AI for. So again, all of those risks are true um, and, uh, and scholars are finding these tools useful still for these purposes. Um, and so, of course, it wasn't long before uh, professional organizations and um, journals 
um, put out statements and made uh, standards in their in their pages uh, available to researchers. So COPE um, is a committee on um, on publication ethics. Um, a lot of journals, a lot of big journals uh, refer to COPE or take lead from COPE in determining sort of how they're telling scholars who wanna publish in their pages what to do with uh, AI use. Um, and COPE has been pretty solid from the beginning that AI tools can't meet the requirements for, for authorship and that um, authors who use AI tools um, are responsible for uh, validating um, and they must be transparent about um, what they're what they're using it for. Um, these are too small to read, but mostly I just um, smattered them up here just to um, show you that um, Springer, Sage, and Elsevier have all made statements about this. You can find similar statements in the in the pages of or uh, on the websites of um, a huge variety of of journals and organizations across disciplines. Um, and so if, if you are considering uh, publishing work and you've used generative AI, I would say, make sure you're checking uh, the guideline, the author guidelines for the journal you're targeting. Um, make sure you know the professional standards of your, of your organization before moving forward with any research that you've done that uses generative AI tools. Um, I thought it was interesting to kind of uh, synthesize some of the things I saw in common. So I looked at a ton of um, professional guidance statements on the pages of journals uh, in different disciplines, um, uh, in professional organizations, scholarly organizations. Um, these five were things that I saw in common between all of them. Um, really a focus on transparency. Some of them require disclosure statements, but all of them require in some way that um, authors are acknowledging what AI tools are used and how. Um, Many, uh, all of them acknowledged um, the the importance of um, risk that I mentioned, bias, hallucinations, limitations, et cetera. Um, all of them uh, recommended the use of a method section or somewhere in the text of an article a scholar is writing to describe the use of generative AI in their data collection or in their analysis or in their process. Um, using citations in appropriate citation style to acknowledge AI tools. So that slide that I had up of all the lib guides that share information about MLA, APA, et cetera. Um, and then the verification and validity that was in common everywhere I read these guidelines. Um, these are sort of assurances that um, the researchers have tested the validity and accuracy of the resources they're using and of the outputs they're generating. And so I feel like these five actually give us um, some really useful direction for how to talk to students about citing AI. Um, and I think they kind of reflect those four suggestions that I had, ideas that I'm seeing um, circulating amongst some of our faculty, um, that you've got to find some way to get students to think about uh, how they're using the tools and to tell you that whether that's in the text of something they're writing, in a resources page, in a reflection, in a presentation, they have to be able to articulate what they've, what they've used a tool for um, and, and how they used it. Um, the method section, I think is part of that. Um, that's a sort of in-text way of acknowledging the transparency um, element. Um, and then the, the last two, the risk component, I think is, it's important for students to know those elements um, before they even make the choice. I think students should know uh, some of the implications of this choice. So whether that's a conversation in class, a statement on the syllabus, a statement in an assignment page uh, or directions that, um, that kind of ask students to kind of look at this particular ethical challenge of, of risk. And then the verification and validity um, is, I haven't seen, I guess actually one person I've seen who's, who uh, Michelle Lancy again presented on this at um, the uh, Ann Farron conference in January. And she talked about asking her students to use, um, to, 
to collect research using an AI tool. Uh, and then part of their assignment involved validating that research, check it. And, and so students for themselves had the experience of noticing that um, when they went to find the source that an AI tool had recommended to them, some of them couldn't find the source. And so that experience, um, I thought I thought was a really great way to kind of allow students to, to experience for themselves um, some of those risk questions about what happens when this doesn't exist, what are, what are the implications of hallucinations, and for them to experience kind of um, that, that challenge. So finding ways to, um, to require students to verify and validate uh, what they're getting from AI tools. Um, so I guess big picture, my advice is uh, has to do with kind of how you're giving guidance in the syllabus, but also in every assignment. So just because you say on the syllabus, um, it's okay to use AI tools in this class to brainstorm, but not for any other reason, um, you still might want to on each assignment, on each project, on each activity, kind of have a section in there. In, uh, if you have a template or if you have um, a kind of a standard structure for the assignments that you give, make a section that kind of allows you to acknowledge whatever that assignment's guidelines for AI use might be. Um, consider, I, I, I'm using the term extra citation activity, which means sort of like outside of citation, find a way to acknowledge resources. Um, so beyond the bibliography, a reflection, a resources page, using the methods section, et cetera. Um, and then model strategies of professional and scholarly journals and organizations, like use those um, things that are happening in your own fields or in um, scholarly work in general. So like COPE, for example, is a kind of, um, uh, it's not discipline specific, so you could use um, guidelines um, from them. That's my, I think that's my last slide here. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. I see that there's been some activity in the comments. So I wanna make sure that we kind of bring those up. Um, I didn't catch up as I was, as I was going through slides. So um, maybe we should just sort of take a minute, look through the slide, uh, the um, chat and see what kind of questions um, might, might make sense to go from here. Does anybody see any questions that um, you want to draw out of the chat? Or any questions that you brought up before that um, I, I sidestepped, ignored, or didn't answer? <laughs> Allison, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So I don't know if to do, what degree you'll feel comfortable answering this, but one of the things I was wondering about is students their ethical take on it in other words do we need to like get fundamental with them about the ethics at hand or do are they aware that yeah what i'm doing is sketchy i'm going to get away with it or do are they so fundamentally okay with it that that if we wanted to start addressing we have to sort of chip away at the ethical side of it and give them like a principled reason to care about all the other practical stuff that follows next does that make sense? That, it does. Uh, yeah, it's a really hard question. I So I think, and this answer is probably going to be annoying, <laughs> but uh, I think there's absolutely a section of our student cohort that doesn't know if what they're doing is okay or not okay. And I think that's actually that as actually a statement I would make about a lot of academic integrity questions, right? Like I think there's a lot a large portion of students who aren't sure if what they're doing is okay or not okay in a certain context, right? So even I think somebody raised a question in the chat even about um, uh, 
you know, are, is it okay for mom to read your paper? Is it okay for your sister to read your paper, right? Those are challenging questions that require, I think, ethical reasoning and ethical engagement to really kind of um, get at the answer. Um, because it's con it, it has to do with context, right? Is it okay to read for mom to read your paper? Well, is she moving stuff around? Is she typing in the text? Did she delete a whole paragraph? Then the answer is no, right? But if mom's just like, I just love how much you're learning in American University, then it's like, great, let mom read the stuff, right? And so um, there are there are these ethical questions. I think students benefit from talking about those. Students, in my experience really like talking about those questions. They're hard for them. Like they, they, they have to chew on them. Like it's, it's a conversation. There'll be people who disagree. Um, it, it's always a productive conversation to me. So the first answer I, I will give is like, yes, I think the ethical reasoning component has to be engaged. I think, and, and I do think there's a starting from scratch element. Um, students tend to sort of see all these things as like the internet. And so it's like, I put up uh, Ethan Mollick's, uh, the chapter titles from Ethan Mollick's book, because I feel like this is not Google. This is not the tech, this is not even predicto text in your text messages. This is much more powerful and much more complicated than that. I think, I think if students knew how these tools worked, it would change how they think about them a little bit. And so I think about, uh, I think the more opportunities you can give students to engage on that, the more empowered they are to make their own choices about whether to use them or not, obviously within the parameters of the guidelines that you've given. I will, I will put an addition onto that. <laughs> this is the annoying part, which is like, there are absolutely students who are using AI tools to shortcut. Oh, sorry. It's like a fire alarm. Okay, it went off. I can't promise that's not going to happen again. Sorry. <laughs> the, the last part of my answer to your question, Adam, was um, there's de there definitely are students who are using these tools as shortcuts and substitutes for what we expect to be their own work or learning. There are definitely students who are uh, who know that it's not cool to use this tool this way, and they are doing it. And I will say that from what I've seen, like in the tiny slice that I have access to, um, students are saying things like, this is busy work. I don't understand why I'm doing this assignment anyway. Um, uh, the professor doesn't give me any comments on it. So why should I submit it? I submitted this th six weeks ago and it doesn't seem like it was that important. Uh, and then the comments that we hear a lot from students about like, I was so busy. I have work and a million other things. I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. I have a lot of personal life things. I have jobs, like all of that kind of stuff. So um, that's what I've heard about some of the things students are saying about like why they've chosen the shortcut substitute route. Um, yeah. Um, looking in the chat, I see Laura has a hand up. Hi, Laura. Um, yes. Oh, sorry, I must have my um, camera protector on. Hold on, let me remove that. That's okay. Your fire alarm's not going off, so you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my question is, so based on what you said in terms of having an AI usage section of the syllabus, um, so then could I tell my students something like, you? I mean, obviously, I will work on the wording on this, but something like, you cannot use AI to write your papers, but you can use it to check spelling, punctuation, grammar, kind of be very clear and explicit about what they can and can't do. 
Yes, I would absolutely recommend that. And so uh, Christina Domian, who's uh, the AI uh, fellow, I think I think I saw her here. She and I were gonna work on some specific, like another round of specific syllabus and assignment guidance uh, over the summer to share with folks. But yeah, I think, I think you've got it right. Sort of, it's okay to use AI to do this and not this. Um, it's okay to use it in this assignment this way, but not this way. I think um, is really helpful uh, for students and for and for you. Um, I think um, because it forces you to kind of identify what the priorities are in your learning outcomes. Right? It's like, oh, if a student can. Um, I don't know, I always start with this, but I used Canva's magic designer to produce my slides, <laughs> um, but all the content is my own, right? Um, and part of it is because for me, like if I were to make learning outcomes for myself for this um, presentation, like the design part is not the most important, right? The priority is um, in what I'm able to convey about what I know about AI and citation. So like thinking about what skills are essential for the human students to do, valuing and prioritizing those, what skills or what things are okay to offload or outsource to a, to a machine and identifying what, what functions or what capabilities those are. Um, because for me, I do want my students to have, you know, proper spelling, grammar, punctuation, but I don't necessarily care if they are the ones doing it. I mean, I don't want them to submit a paper that's, you know, unreadable and full of errors, but yeah. I'm okay with them using AI to catch the errors. Yeah. This is, raises a lot of interesting, I mean, I've had a lot more faculty who've gotten in touch with me this semester to say, um, I just, it's okay if students are submitting a paper that's kind of a mess, because that helps me understand sort of where they are and where I can target my teaching or how I can like, where are their weaknesses, right? What I really want is like the authentic mess and not the, the perfect, you know, the perfect grammar necessarily. But it depends again on sort of what are the learning outcomes that guide your decision-making in, in letting them, in letting them know. Wonderful, thank you. That was very helpful. Anyone else wanna jump in? Hi, Sonia. Just quickly, I, this increasingly reminds me of statistics, you know, like where we run regressions and declare uh, an R squared of such and such to be, uh, you know, such and such at this and this threshold all the time. Um, you know, and, and nobody asks and says, you've got to compute this by hand to prove that that regression coefficient is indeed significant and going in the right way and doesn't have, you know, third factors driving it. And so so this all of what you outlined regarding, you know, transparency, um, really what's a methodological appendix and all of that increasingly looks like what you would do with a technical appendix to say, oh, I used SPSS and this and that coefficient to com come to this conclusion kind of approach. That's really interesting. Yeah, and I think it, this gets to, I see Inara's comment about um, is having a resources page going to become standard practice um, at AU? Um, I I can ask some colleagues that I've seen this from if I can share some examples because I think it would be useful to look at. Um, but what you're describing, Sonia, is very similar. And if you're seeing it in the professional spaces, it would make sense to ask students to do something similar um, to model their work on what's happening in professional or scholarly scholarly spaces. I know I don't know if this will become standard practice. I mean. Um, my, you heard it here first, my prediction is that cit a lot of citation styles will start doing this. So like, um, you know, uh, some citation styles allow for a works consulted list in which you would uh, acknowledge works that uh, you consulted, but that don't have ideas or language that appears in the, uh, the writing you're submitting. And so something kind of like that, I am guessing at least in some of the humanities oriented styles and social science styles, we will see something like that. But um, I don't I don't know, but if I'm right, you all heard it here first. <laughs> um, I'll go to Karan and then I, I, I've got a couple more from the chat that I'll come back to. Hi, Karan. Hi, Sonia. Um, 
Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry that I joined late. And Allison, you'll have to send me your slides. I had another meeting. But yeah, no, I just wanted to say a, a word or two um, about CoGod. And um, especially that I'm so glad that Hannah asked the question about what CoGod is saying, because we are a community at AU. And just to clarify, and I know our CoGod librarian is here, Katie Hutt, as well, um, who still goes to many of our uh, first year courses and our writing intensive course to talk about information literacy and going to good old Bender and using databases. And so that is a very strong impulse right now uh, at CoGod as well. Uh, faculty are kind of all over the place of having very different rules so that I think what Hannah was hinting at students confusion because there are different rules at different planets also mm -hmm. exists in an inter intraplanetary way uh, at COGOT. And um, honestly, discussion and transparency. I, I tell my students and my faculty friends, it's the equivalent of having the sex talk with your kids. Like nobody wants to talk about it, but nobody wants to deal with what happens when there's consequences, right? And so it's uncomfortable, but students are so eager for those conversations. So I really wanted to validate you saying that. Um, finally, we did a survey and, um, COGOD students, it was 200 COGOD students. This was in March and a large number, I don't want to say it was a majority, but I think like 42% were concerned or very concerned about the ethics of AI. And some of those, uh, in the qualitative comments are our business and entertainment students who feel like copyright and intellectual uh, property and, you know, Drake versus Kendrick Lamar, you know, and doing fakes of songs that they feel strongly that your own creative product is your own creative product. And so it's <laughs> Kendrick 100% shed. <laughs> That's funny. Um, you know, so I think we're kind of in this, I think it's going to be a narrow window where students may use it, but they don't feel great about it. And it's a real opportunity for us to talk to them about what that unease is about and get them to critically think about their use. Thanks, Kron, that's great. And I think you have a session tomorrow, you're in a session tomorrow where you're talking about your survey results, right? I'm excited to- We do, that yes, that Christina is awesome. moderating. So everybody come. Awesome, thanks. Um, I wanted to come back to a question that came up in the chat. Um, that sort of touches on this. I also, you know, from, from where I'm sitting, I'm also hearing from students who are saying, um, this is hard to navigate, um, Hannah, to your question. Like there's different rules in different classes. There's different um, expectations. People are saying different things. A lot of people are not saying anything at all. Um, and so I think uh, it's true that students are noticing that. I mean, I guess my response is that like all our syllabi, look different on a lot of other things. <laughs> um, you know, like my uh, late paper policy is different from yours, maybe. Um, my, uh, uh, my, the way I use a, a discussion board may be different from yours, right? And so um, students are used to these variations in courses, right? But they're not used to this kind of variation, right? So it's kind of like, how do we help students get used to the fact that like AU has, I mean, and this gets to another question in the chat about sort of what's happening at other universities. Um, to my knowledge, there are no universities that are saying across the board, our policy is no AI tool ever. Um, and in fact, there are more universities um, that are leaning in the other direction. Arizona State is the one that comes to mind. Um, they have uh, partnered with ChatGPT. ChatGPT is now part of their Canvas interface. Um, and so there are absolutely universities that are um, sort of go going all in, so to speak, on, on AI. This is absolutely true at most, if not all, business schools um, uh, in, around um, the US. And so I think that the idea of having a singular policy about what's okay and what's not um, in terms of AI tools won't happen. Um, I think we can work and do more to 
like help people get ideas of how to articulate for themselves and for their discipline um, to connect people with being aware of what's going on in their discipline. Um, and I think uh, do more on some of the other like sort of tentacles of, of AI that are in our community, not just in the teaching and learning space. So like faculty research is one, like I brought up um, journals and professional organizations having standards it partially as a way to like model what we might do with our students. But um, as a researcher myself, if I want to use a, a generative AI, um, I, I, I want to know like, is that a is that okay? Uh, if I have data, if I'm if I'm a, a program that wants to do an assessment, can I use an AI tool to assess my program? Um, and so I think we'll see more guidance um, about things like that. Other ways AI may or may not be used, like in our community. Um, but uh, but I don't think we'll see a single kind of uh, one size fits all um, AI policy. I I do think though this is another. Here's my. I've really got my crystal ball out today. Um, I think I think we'll also see more um, AI. I mentioned seeing attention to AI literacy, but I think there will be some kind of um, curricular attention to that at universities around uh, around the U.S. Uh, AI literacy coursework, certification, something that does kind of uh, the, the sort of foundational building of what is AI and how does it work. Um, there are folks who think that, you know, writing prompts is um, part of that initial work. It may be, but I actually think writing prompts is gonna become obsolete pretty soon based on what I've read because these tools are getting smarter. They're kind of gonna know what we want before we prompt them. That sounded really bad, but, <laughs> but I think uh, a lot, there's a lot of folks who agree that um, we won't have to work as hard to create prompts and personalities when we prompt these tools. Um, and so that may not end up being the way to focus our attention to AI literacy, but it's interesting to, to think about. Um, hey, Nadine. Hi, Allison. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree that there's probably not going to be a one size fit all in terms of AI guidance and AI wording, even though that would be very convenient if it was. Um, but I liked your comment about concentrating on learning outcomes, because um, I'm in the biology department this last semester. I just taught uh, an upper level developmental biology class and some of our upper level classes, it's a 400, 600 split. So some of the some of the students are undergrad, some are grad. And part of um, us evaluating the students is we need to have different assessments. And one difference that I have is the final project. Um, for undergrads, they have to do a literature review. Um, so they have to pick a topic, go into the primary literature and summarize, you know, what's what's the state of, of the field. Whereas for the grad students, they have to do a grant proposal. Uh, and part of that grant proposal, of course, is a, a small literature review, but the most important part of that assignment is their creative thinking and recognizing what are some open questions in the field and here are the experiments that I'm going to do to try to address those. Um, and I don't have good wording on AI guidance, but as I thought of you saying, concentrate on the learning outcomes, I can see where I can emphasize to the undergrads, you can't use AI to write your lit review because the entire project is the lit review. So that's obviously not fair, but for the grad students, if only a small portion of it is the, the, is the lit review, and that gives you an idea about what are the open questions in the field, and the most important part is what you do to identify you know, what, what the experiments are you want to do, then that seems logical to me. Now, the problem there is it's not different policies between different schools at AU or even different departments, but now you're in the same class, and I'm telling part of the class you can use AI for this purpose, and the part of the class I'm saying you can't. And that can be problematic and hopefully students can understand the nuances between those those differences but i think the key there and again i go back to i like that idea of concentrating on the learning outcomes if you can convey to the students why those two different rules are in place for those two different groups based on the learning outcomes i think there is some logic behind that but in that case how can you have one set of wording to guide students in terms of how can they use ai when even in the same class you're giving kind of different guidance based on the assignments yeah, that's a juicy problem. I mean, I in that like I kind of like it. I mean, I kind of love the idea actually of saying in an in a in an assignment that everyone gets and it's a class with grad graduate students and undergraduates. If you're an undergraduate, this is what you're doing. If you're a graduate, this is what you're doing and here's why. And let's talk about that. I feel like that's right to me like right on the money in terms of 
that's a valuable conversation that, like you said, um, has to incorporate learning outcomes. For the graduate students, the learning outcomes are slightly different because they're expected to be more advanced in their studies. And for the undergraduates, part of what you're trying to teach them involves um, doing this work themselves. And so it's kind of like when to offload, when not to be, what work has to be um, done by a human and why. Um, I, I go back a lot to um, some student comments I've heard where students will say, I'm trying to avoid using AI if I can't judge the outcome, the output. Like if I don't understand what it's telling me, then I don't want to just copy and paste that into my homework. Like if I don't, if I don't have the skills, tools, knowledge to assess whether it's right. I mean, I think that's probably how, you know, the student, a, a, a student put it like, I can't, if I can't tell it's right, I don't want to use it. And so I feel like there's something useful in, in there that helps students think about this big question of, of why. Um, otherwise, I think, and I, and I see this from students that, that my office works with, otherwise it seems like another item, of, an, another item on the list of things you can't do, um, which is like, why can't I do it? Because you can't do it. You know, what I mean? it's like it's sort of like the because I said so of, of, of academic guidelines. Right. Um, if you're not getting into the why of it, um, you're probably leaving something on the table in terms of helping them really understand, um, you know, how to how to negotiate this. Any other um, questions or topics we want to open up, things that I didn't address that you were hoping um, to, to get out here. Alison, so I put some sources in the, in the chat awesome. and, um, these are really, really nice websites, basically AI powered websites. A couple of them actually show students. So if they're looking for a topic, um, a couple of these will actually provide students with a map and will show them how research is connected. And so this is not um, OpenAI's ChatGPT, where um, ChatGPT may hallucinate. These are legit um, sources where the research papers are um, uh, present and they can be mapped out. And I. I believe that some of them are behind paywalls, so then the students will have to access them through the uh, the AU library, but they can sort of show the, they, they can actually see the connection between research. And so if, you know, I, this is something that I would actually encourage students to do, because I think that if they have this tool, um, it's going to make, um, uh, okay, good. <laughs> then, then they probably, you know, feel like they don't need ChatGPT's help because this is something that they can um, they can get on a legitimate way. And so, going back to the learning objectives, if we're talking about okay, you know, doing research, literature review. So this is something that we can do and tell students, hey, look, you know, there are some AI power tools here that you can use, and you know, you can pick and choose from the list and say, I want you to use connected papers, or I want you to use site AI. So then you actually tell them exactly which ones you want uh, them to use. And so there's no misunderstanding and there's no, you know, chat uh, GPT use. And so it's almost like we're moving the friction from um, the student self sitting in front of the computer going over the uh, AU library's website, you know, source one, source two, source 125, <laughs> and they can already see the connection uh, between the papers. So then it's, it's, you know, they might feel that, okay, I'm one step or, you know, 25 steps uh, closer to, to my goal. And, but, you know, I could be just, you know, hoping for this or wishful thinking, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I think that's really helpful too, because um, I mean, I can't really speak a whole lot to this, but I certainly can say I've been to a number of, or visited with a number of faculty, I've been to a number of um, sort of events throughout the year and seen creative ways that people are using AI, um, a, a lot of sort of like validate 
oriented assignments. That's kind of how I categorize them, like assignments that ask students to like sort of use an AI tool to do something and then check it against their own abilities or knowledge or experience. Um, those, are, those have been useful for a lot of colleagues, um, like computer science faculty who may be asking students to write code, have an AI write, you know, have an AI tool writing the code, check the code, right? And so those are really common and you can see examples of those on a lot of different um, like faculty development websites. Um, but the, the use of AI tools to visualize something or to present something in another, uh, in another format can be really useful for different, um, different kinds of learners. Um, connected papers, like you said, kind of visualizes uh, the, the academic conversation we talk to students about all the time. Um, I think that's a really useful, um, a really useful tool and way to kind of incorporate AI in, in a, in a meaningful way that doesn't substitute or shortcut right through uh, their learning that you're that you're aiming for. Um, other questions, comments, or things you wanted to talk about before um, before we take off? I should put. Um, I think everybody's probably seen the Academic Integrity SharePoint site at this point but I'm going to put the link in the chat just because you'd worry I was an AI if I didn't. Um, it, this is a really dynamic uh, site. You should you have to log in to get to it. Um, th there are faculty resources that are here. I keep updating them. Um, I'm not a graphic designer and I'm not using any kind of magical features to um, improve the, the visuals here. I'm open to feedback if there are things you think should go on these pages, if there are um, resources um, uh, you'd like to see. I mentioned Christina and I would be working on some updated syllabus and um, assignment language uh, over the summer. So I'll put those up here. Um, I'd love to start collecting um, examples of resources pages or disclosure statements or other um, disciplinary uh, ways of um, uh, other disciplinary ways of acknowledging um, the use of AI tools and help um, in general. So I'm going to keep updating this, but uh, feel free to um, to jump in. I I'll also reiterate um, the Ezra Klein uh, podcast interview with Ethan Mollick. Ethan Mollick's blog is fascinating. Um, the New York Times uh, did a an episode of the Daily. Um, a, it's called the original sin of AI that I'll also plug because I think that gets at some of the copyright issues and intellectual property questions that you brought up, Karan. Um, those are unresolved until those relevant court cases get decided, um, but brings up um, big topics. I've got a bunch of books on my reading list, uh, so I'll report back as soon as things uh, slow down and I can <laughs> and I can jump back into uh, conversations like this. So. Um, I am looking at the time. I think there's an evaluation to fill out, but I'm happy to hang around for more conversation or um, or questions. Um, and I uh, thank you for taking time on this on this Monday to hang out. Good to see everybody. Thanks so much, Allison. Hey, friend, did you, um, you might have mentioned this before I joined a half hour late, um, but are you all coming out with a new version of the Academic Integrity Code sometime this summer? Like what's been the result of that whole year long project I know you've been involved in? Good question. Um, so probably this summer we're gonna have uh, on the SharePoint page, like advice and details for uh, assignments and syllabus. Um, I'm. I am guessing that the code update won't happen until the fall. Um, it's in the provost's office now. Okay. Um, so all the work, you know, we handed over, you know, all of the work of that task force and advice. And um, I think there are other conversations that will be happening about um, AI in general, like I mentioned, just sort of other community pieces uh, of how AI is used um, at AU. So I think there'll be some explorations about that. Um, but yeah, and I'm happy to, I mean, I often mention like happy to work with, with anyone who has like specific 
um, cohort related needs. So I think at some point this summer, I'm going to be working with some of the SOC faculty to develop some language for syllabi and assignments that are specific to um, some of the stuff they're doing. Um, so happy to join any departments, uh, cohorts, programs, anything. Um, and I mean, you know, Karan, because we've worked um, we've worked together on this. So like doors, doors still open, anything I can do, just let me know. Yeah, no, we'll get on your calendar. And our Dean uh, named a young alum who's in our IDEC and analytics department as our kind of AI coordinator. Angela Rue too. And I'd love you to know her and her to know you great. as well. So maybe I can facilitate a meeting with all of us. That sounds great. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Allison. Same Thanks. Any other questions? All right. I think we'll close it up. Thank you all. Thanks. Have a good one, everybody. Bye.